I think that's Don Fox who did the same basic thing after Cronauer was, uh, was sent back. That is Chris Noel back there yeah. who did a, uh, uh, a yeah, I guess she was entertaining. She did a pre recorded program. She was a, uh, a bikini bombshell from West Palm yeah, Beach. Right. Yes, yeah. she was. She's still around. She uh, still does Rolling Thunder and uh, visits uh, VA hospitals and things. I hope you learned how to pronounce Benoit. I don't know how many times she called it Ben Hoa Airport. <laughs> Come on, Ben Hoa, really? <laughs> was there any other entertainment that you had? USO shows? Anything at all besides the wonderful well, radio? Well, let's see. Maybe Ben Dorn came and Bob Hope came and Ann Mark. Margaret came. They didn't come where we were. <laughs> <laughs> we got Mark Joy. <laughs> yeah, we saw Hello Dolly with Mark. I remember Ray. they used to bring Korean bands through. Right. Yeah. So I remember Korean bands with girl singers, and they always remember lolling on a lever. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, that just rolling, rolling, rolling on a lever. <laughs> they weren't exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they weren't exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who told you that? No. Tina. Yeah, Tina. Turner. Yeah, Tina Turner. You were a disguise. The Ike and Tina Turner. That's why I got fired. Yeah. Oh, I remember. What else do you want to know, kid? Well, I, I also had in my notes here just noted that Adrian Cronauer actually turns 80 years old, and that movie's 30 years old. And he's an attorney he's now. Oh, is he really? I wonder if he yeah. says that to the judge when he walks into the court. <laughs> Probably not. Probably Probably not. not. Uh, watching one of the cable channels a couple weeks ago, there was a House Hunters International, and a family was looking to move to Vietnam, well, to Da Nang. Okay. And it's a beautiful city. It's a beautiful place. It looks, you know, there's lots of expats live there. Have any of you been back? Have any of you not gone back and no, no. No. I know? No, I wouldn't I wouldn't take a chance on it. I'd step off the plane and get blown to hell. I'm not gonna... <laughs> I made it once I made it through there once and that's that was enough for not me. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, that was enough for me. No, I would like to go back. I have some uh, members of my unit uh, that I'm gonna have a reunion with in May have been back. It was a beautiful country. It looked very much like Hawaii. In fact the first couple of times I went to Hawaii, I could never figure out why I was so uneasy at night. And finally, it dawned on me. It's the same climate. It's the same foliage. And John, you already started a career in radio. I've been in radio about two and a half years when I got drafted. And the first thing I learned in the army, I didn't know anything about the military. Uh, I, nobody in my family served. I didn't know anything. And the first thing I learned is that they, it, it was like civilian life. They wanted to know you and what you've done. And when they found out that I had been a broadcaster. Immediately, almost immediately, out of boot camp at Fort Bliss in El Paso, uh, uh, I was I was in radio. I was the information officer at Fort Huachuca, which you mentioned an old cavalry fort. Uh, fort Huachuca is 17 miles from the Mexican border, and uh, uh, they reopened it for Vietnam and a lot of troops at Fort Huachuca, and uh, uh, so you know the place came open and had another life. But uh, uh, yeah, I. I was drafted and you know, it got in the army. They found out I'd been a broadcaster, and so I was doing radio. And then I came back and I set up six jobs while I was in Vietnam. And uh, I came back and every person had moved. Every person had left. I called. I started calling like the day after I got back from Vietnam. Everybody, moved. Charlie Russell at Kelvin El Paso went went across the street to Kehe. He was a Kehe over 30 years. <laughs> he was a Kelp like eight years. That was a lifetime in the 60s. If you were <clears throat> any place that long, you, it was a lifetime. And uh, Charlie was gone, and I was I was caught flat-footed. I had to start literally over again. $95 a week at K-Hit in Tucson, and I had to start my career and build everything back up again. Yeah, the same thing, and you got experience, you got training, you had an education there, and then when you came back, that moved you into a career? Well, <clears throat> as, when I was drafted, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when I was drafted, uh, like I said, I was on uh, doing mornings on k -Bay in San Jose, and um, there was a provision that if you were drafted into the military, that they had to make an accommodation for you to come back yeah. after your service. Yeah. 
And so uh, I did that. I came back and talked with George Snell and Lloyd Parr. And uh, they said, well, we have these stations in Las Vegas and they need to be rebuilt and we want you to go there and do that. And so that's what I did and progressed on from there. And Michael, you returned that? I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, did any of you ever, Mike, hello. <laughs> Did any of you ever get close to getting hurt? <coughs> Only every day. Depends on what you consider. Uh, no. <laughs> what you consider close, I had, I had a bullet zing past my head so close I could hear it. They sound yeah. like bees buzzing yeah. by. Yeah. Uh, I was right, I got pinned down during tap. Yeah. We went out to retrieve the bodies of some American civilians that had been gunned down in the middle of the street. And while we were there, the Viet Cong, who were still occupying the radio station, opened fire on us, and we got the heck out of there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. It was, I mean, this was, a, this was, they figured this was going to be the, the great battle that the Japanese always looked for right. against the United States Navy. This was going to be their great battle where they'd run all your sorry asses out of, out of they the They sent 84,000 troops, NVA and Viet Cong, yeah. everywhere in South Vietnam. Yeah, yeah I mentioned guard duty. I uh, was on guard duty at my unit one night. I went back, got my mail and everything, and they put me on guard duty. And I'll never forget, that. there was a folding chair, and there was a big ice freezer with a blue tarp over it, and that was our NCO club. <laughs> we, we got our beer for a dime, dime a can there. And I'm sitting there on guard duty, and <clears throat> these tracer rounds went right by my head. And I went, what the... And I hit the ground, and the lights in our unit went out, and these sirens, and these big sirens went off. And we had two guard towers. We had a guard tower in this corner and a guard tower in this corner. And the guy in this tower opened up with a 50 caliber machine gun. I didn't know what was going on. We had a place where we had to be if there was any kind of activity. So I went to my spot, which was in the front of my unit, along this little highway, and there was a little tiny village right across from my unit. We had tin cans and cardboard boxes. This is the truth. This is what they the Vietnamese lived in, tin cans and cardboard boxes. And I got to my spot, and I'm in this trench, and I'm looking over, and these two Vietnamese army units had come in from each end of this little village, and they met in the middle, and they each thought the other were Viet Cong, and they opened fire on each other, and that's what all the activity was about. Well, they, the Marines got them separated, the Marines were advising them, and the Marines got them separated. And these two Vietnamese lieutenants, Army lieutenants, walk up to each other, and they start yelling at each other. Dang up, boat starts yelling, and this one lieutenant just reaches out, wham, hits this guy right side of the head. And I'm 60 feet away from here at that table. And that guy just locks and loads and killed him right here in front of me. So he killed him, and they started fighting again. They fought till 4 in the morning. And you see people by the flares, if you've seen Apocalypse Now, anybody's seen that movie? They have flares and yellow light and smoke. It was just like that, and, and most of them had pistols. And you see a guy running along, bam, shooting on the leg. Oh, they didn't speak Vietnamese when they got shot. They, they spoke the owl language. Ow, oh, oh, you know. But uh, they fought till four in the morning. It was, it was quite an experience. Well, the closest I ever came, well, a few bullets whizzed by, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but the closest I ever came, we were putting through calls, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and they started to mortar our compound. And you can hear the incoming coming in, they, they walked them in, and it was getting closer and closer, and I knew the next one was going to be right on our shack, on our radio shack. So I got under the desk, as if that was going to help, and it hit, and the window uh, blew in, and glass fell all over us, and it was a little bit of a pause, and then there was an explosion on the other side of the building, and then they started walking away. Wow. So, I mean, they walked right up to our building, and then it went right over the top of us and walked away. So, wow. if they had launched one more, I, I obviously wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be here right now. If you don't, yes, we would. Yeah, and we wouldn't put through those calls. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had sappers get into the ammo dump one night and set off an explosion, and the rest of the night we sat in a bunker while tracer rounds blew over our head, and we didn't know whether they were actually being fired or if it was just the ammo burning, but it also blew up all the CS gas. And so we had this huge, <laughs> yeah, we had huge cloud of CS gas. If you know what that is, it causes you to vomit and do all kinds of other 
unattractive thing, shall we say. It's like tear gas taken to the next level. Yeah, and that kind of wafted over us all night, too. So we spent the night in the bunker with gas masks on, not knowing whether the tracer rounds were actually being fired at us or not. David, I, I have to say thank you, David, because uh, believe it or not, <laughs> this is my first and only experience talking about my Vietnam days. Uh, I came back at the end of 68. There were a lot of parties in Tucson. My wife and I settled in Tucson. We were there for several years. The company transferred me to Phoenix. Got a call one day from Michael Spears at KFRC, and I came to San Francisco. But uh, I would go to parties, we'd go, my wife and I go to parties all the time in Tucson, and Vietnam would come up, because I, I made it very clear to people, I said, look, I got drafted, I got my head shaved, and I got sent to a place where you can get your ass blowed off, and you're going to hear about it, okay? Because I'm going to talk about it, and I did. And people would get up and leave parties, I mean, they would get up and, and, and walk out, they didn't want to hear it about Vietnam. They, I went to the VFW club in Tucson in the beginning of 69. I went to beer on Saturday. And I'd been there 15 minutes and a guy came up to me very, very unfriendly <laughs> and said, uh, you'll have to leave immediately. Right now, you're not welcome here. You can't be here. So I got up and I, I was stunned. I was shocked. I mean, my Vietnam service, I just did what my country told me to do, what they asked me to do. And I didn't get to the door and another guy stopped me. And he said, you can't, you can't be here, you have to leave. So that was my reception. And I've never discussed Vietnam, I've never, 92, I did a radio remote in San Jose at the Santa Clara County Fair. And they didn't tell me it was Vietnam Day. So I get there and I get inside and everything. Well, got, there are a lot of Vietnamese in San Jose. And these guys are all in camouflage, blouse, boots, berets, and they all got weapons, and they had, they had army personnel carriers and all this stuff. Well, I started having flashbacks, and I was babbling, and uh, I started going crazy because that stuff just drives me out of my mind. And uh, uh, some guy found out, big fat white guy, found out I was a Vietnam vet, and he came up to me. The first time, 92, this is 20, almost 30 years, almost 30 years. And he came up to me and he stuck out his hand, I'll never forget. Welcome home! Everybody was doing that. And I just looked at him, you know, I shook his hand. I said, brother, you're about 30 years too late. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, there was no, there was no discussion, no, no nothing. Yeah, well, and I, I want to thank you for today because it's, yeah. it's very important to me. It is. My experience was... <laughs> when, we finally, when we finally came home, we stopped in Hawaii. And we were walking, a bunch of us guys were in khakis, going to our next plane, we were transferring, walking through the Hawaiian airport, Honolulu, and there were balconies up above, and as we walked through, people were lining the balconies, yelling, baby killer, and spitting on us from the balconies. And we couldn't, we were so out of touch, we, I had no idea why they were doing that. I had no idea why, until I got home and, and my wife told me, but that was an unbelievable experience. I, as just like John said, all we were doing was going when we were called and doing what our country asked us to do and to be spit on and called baby killers by my own people. That was a traumatic experience for me. Was there anything at all positive that came out of it? I mean, out of the experience of being over there, I mean, is there anything you can think about? I mean, aside from well, I survived it. You survived it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well. I appreciate this country a lot more. When I got off the plane at uh, Travis, when we came back into Travis, I, I literally kissed the ground when yeah. I came down off, yeah. the, yeah. off the gangway. And no marching bands, no uh, yeah. waving flags, just, just my wife was there as I got off the bus. And uh, she welcomed me home, and at that point, that was good enough for me. And it has yeah. been for 48 years. One of the experiences I had was we landed at Yokota, Japan, on the way home to refuel. Yeah. And I walked into the men's room, and there was a whole group of guys in there that were just on their way over. And we stood there and looked at each other for a couple of minutes, and they kind of looked at me like, is that what I'm going to look like when I Because <laughs> I weighed, I think I weighed 165 pounds. And I, you know, I had a real dark tan and a white handlebar mustache, and looked a little bedraggled because I'd been up for 36 hours waiting for that flight home. Yeah. But yeah, that, just that moment of standing there looking at each other, going, "Oh my God," and I'm looking at them, thinking, "All right, how many of these guys are not coming back?" Yeah, yeah. 
Good. Can you turn around, Michael? I don't know if I've got a couple pictures of you up there. Uh, one of them with the mascot. Oh, yeah, that's Chuck. <laughs> Chuck's a very shy No, it wasn't Monty. No, the Monty Python hadn't been invented. <laughs> <laughs> or we hadn't heard about it in any way. Yeah, yeah, he was a very shy There was a, a gentleman that lived down the road from us that had a, uh, a larger version of Chuck. It was probably, I don't know, maybe 18 feet long. And for a dollar, you could have your picture taken with this giant snake wrapped around you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. No, that's all right. Yeah, but there were snakes over there. There were bugs, uh, uh, scorpions. Yeah, you know all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 yeah, yeah we, I was King Cobra. Armed, Armed, Armed Forces Radio TV in Da Nang was on Monkey Mountain, mm -hmm. and I said, "That's what an interesting name for a place, Monkey Mountain. I wonder what that's all about." And the the highway it came through an Air Force base, and then you literally just went up this little asphalt trail and it was foot back turns all the way up until you got to Monkey Mountain up on top. And I was out there one day, my, uh, I had a little three-quarter ton uh, vehicle. I don't know if you know Army vehicles, but it, it's bigger than a Jeep, but smaller than a deuce and a half. It had a canvas top on it. I love that thing. It had more fun in a 